Um, I'll call the select board meeting for Monday, October 19th, 2020. Um, first thing to do is to approve the agenda. Do we have any changes or modifications? Um, yeah, Mark, there's one thing I'd like to add. It should be pretty quick. Uh, we've got a request from the Green Mountain Romers, the snowmobile club, the local snowmobile club about um, opening some highways for winter snow machine travel. Just Any particular, on. just under manager items? Wherever you want to put it is fine. Okay, we'll put it under manager items. Um, can I get a uh, motion to approve the agenda with a change? Make a motion to approve the agenda with that one change from Bill. Second. All right, it was uh, I'll give Katie the second and Nat approve, uh, made a motion to approve. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, next is uh, the consent agenda items, which is only the minutes from September 21st meeting. Um, does anyone have a motion to approve the minutes? I make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Uh, any members of the public joining us tonight that would like to say anything before we move on to the select board items? All right, uh, the first item on select board items is revitalizing Waterbury MOU update. And I'm assuming Karen, that's for you. Yeah, so Karen is here uh, to speak to this, uh, to answer questions that you might have about where RW is right now, what, what's been going on. Uh, as a reminder, um, We've been operating under an MOU, which basically says that the select board should give revitalizing Waterbury information by um, October 1st, I think it is, if we're planning not to uh, fund the economic development director's position in the following year. Uh, we had a brief discussion about that back in August, I think it was, and the consensus was given where we are with the Main Street reconstruction and COVID in particular, that um, we wanted to continue this arrangement with RW, uh, at least for 2021. From my perspective, I think that, you know, they're a, a really good local organization that has provided a lot of service. Uh, we have a separate contract with them right now for the Main Street um, community outreach. Uh, reach to businesses. Uh, Karen can speak to that a little bit, but this MOU is specifically about the economic development director. And um, it's very similar to the MOU that we have right now. Uh, toward the end, it, it really tries to make this kind of an evergreen document. It talks about the amount of money that we have appropriated in 2020, which is 44.30 per month. And then going forward, um, it suggests that unless the, the select board tells RW before October 1st, uh, we'll go to town meeting, we'll present a budget. And if that budget passes, um, the uh, amount of money would just be divided by 12 from April 1st through March 31st of subsequent years. So I think the MOU is pretty straightforward. Um, it gets amended if either party wants to amend it and comes back to the board. But I think this document, if you approve it, can go unamended and we can just keep kind of rolling along um, uh, uninterrupted until we get interrupted either by one of the parties or the voters. So with that, I'll be quiet and Karen can say a few words. Everyone. Um... I think Bill pretty much summarized it as we were reviewing um, some documents. We realized the MOU 
did a lot of referencing to the village and that we just really needed to clean it up. Um, Alyssa's on the, um, on the call too, uh, if you have any questions. Uh, but the other goal here was that we didn't want to have to rewrite the document every April after the town um, approved its town minutes uh, or the town budget. Uh, so it's really just a, it was a housekeeping uh, piece uh, to make sure that the relationship was still strong and we had an MO that uh, uh, sort of dotted the T's and crossed the I's. Well, you know what I mean, cross the T's and dot the I's uh, going forward. Uh, I know Alyssa gave you her um, sort of six month report uh, in August. I think we were both here and was able to give you a good of what we're doing. And um, we do give you two reports a year plus are available to answer questions at any time. Uh, and um, we do feel like we have a really good strong working relationship and are happy to answer any questions. I'll ask Alyssa real quickly if she has anything she wants to say. Sorry, this lighting is never good to Zoom calls. Um, hi, everyone. No, I don't really have anything to add other than, as has been said, I don't think this changes the scope of my work at all. It really, again, just removes outdated references, but happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Yeah, the, the two reports that um, Karen spoke about are memorialized now in the MOU. Um, and Alyssa has been very good with that. Um, I do get uh, an agenda and an invitation to all of the WACDC meetings and uh, try to attend when I can. I haven't been for a while. I even set my alarm clock the last meeting and still ended up for other reasons having to miss it. So I'll, I'll try next time, Alyssa. Sounds good. And also Mark Fryer, if folks don't know, is a member of that group as well and also will be at meetings sometimes just as another select board connection. I think I'll just add one other little quick thing is that um, we have spent the last three years really focused on Main Street and it's been really important uh, to have the Economic Development Director as a part of uh, the multi-pronged approach to support our businesses in the town during Main Street. That contract with the town and VTrans um, expires uh, more or less in the next six months when the project's done will be done, but uh, there is still plenty of work um, that to do to support our businesses as we come out of COVID-19 and, um, and really turn a corner um, on a sort of a new Waterbury that we will be working uh, to support. So just want to share that too. So my well, we recommendation would be for the board to approve the MOU. Um, while we have you here, what what's the feedback you're getting from businesses in terms of concerns about going into winter? Anything that they think we can be doing as a town? Um, I'm sure a lot are have cons their concerns, but I don't know if there's anything you can think of offhand. I don't have a specific um, recommendation at this point, other than to say we are um, asking the same question, and I would say it's. Um, I think folks are kind of dealing with a lot right now. So getting the responses on some of that have been challenging. Um, we are collaborating with Stowe and the Mad River Valley, which has been exciting in particular as we have kind of some common hospitality lodging themes. Um, so there's a meeting this Thursday with folks in the lodging world and there'll be restaurant and retail in subsequent weeks just to kind of, again, share what's happening on the ground. I think there is, as you've seen at least Mark, um, some sector specific kind of organizing happening where there's specific concerns in the lodging world and the restaurant world. Um, but in terms of something that's at um, like a select board level for action or support, um, most of the asks I'm hearing at this point are kind of for higher level financial assistance, which would be state or federal. Um, we are still helping folks to navigate that. Actually, just this afternoon, they came out with another round of hazard pay grants and things like that. So some of that does continue to still be up in the air. And I would anticipate that through the end of the year, particularly as um, I know the state at least was fortunate to get a substantial appropriation and um, we meet weekly with Teresa Wood and she's been filling us in. Um, they have to spend that money. Um, and so some things may be reallocated. 
Um, we had a lot of folks um, interested in technical assistance around websites, marketing, advertising, and the like. Um, but that's kind of, again, unfortunately, the answer is I don't have a great ask specifically for the select board, if, but if one emerges, I will certainly pass it along. All right, um, do any of the other select board members have any questions for Karen or Alyssa? No, uh, just, just, just a comment, Mark. Um, I do think, you know, this just memorializes an agreement that we just, you know, going to enter into. It still doesn't have any impact us if, you know, if funding is going to be changed at some point in time. So I just think this is a smart thing. And I, I give RW, you guys have done a great job. And I really commend you for all your work and keep up, keep up the good work. Yeah, I, I agree with Michael's comments. I think, um, you know, we're lucky to have organizations like RW that have so much volunteer time, you know, that doesn't, you know, that really does go a long way. And I know you guys do a lot with a little, so we, we really appreciate the efforts you guys are putting in. Um, can I get a motion to, um, is it to just adopt the memorandum of understanding or what's the, uh, what's the motion we're looking for? Uh, you want to make a motion to uh, approve the MOU and authorize the manager to sign it if that's what you like. Would anyone like to make that motion? I make a motion to approve the MOU and uh, give uh, the town manager the right to in enter into an agreement with RW. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. The motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those members in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, Karen and Alyssa. Thanks for your help getting this done, Karen. Thank you, everybody. It's really, um, as always, we really appreciate your support. Call us if you ever have questions. Yeah, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks. Um, next on the agenda, we have the Vermont State Police Lieutenant White status report. You guys hear me? So, yeah. Yes, we can, Dave. Thank you. Um, so, Lieutenant White, who is um, uh, the supervisor of the two troopers that are assigned to Waterbury, is here with us this evening. Uh, we've tried a couple of different times to uh, have a meeting with him and, and with COVID and everything else that's been going on and some of the challenges with the state budget. It's difficult to, to make this work. He is with us this evening, um, and I have sent out to you um, his August report, uh, which is the last one that we have uh, from him in terms of statistical report. I noticed Mark McCare is here on the uh, Zoom meeting with us tonight, and I want to publicly thank Mark for taking the information that Dave sends every month and puts it in the form that you're looking at it here, which is uh, you know a narrative with uh, statistics. So um, I guess what I'd like to do first, Mark, is just let Lieutenant White um, make uh, whatever statement he'd like to make and talk about things that are going on and that are important to him, and then. Uh, see if the board has any questions either about the statistics or just the service in general. So go ahead, Dave. All right, um, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to have me on this evening. Um, obviously we're into uh, year two of this uh, full service contract. I know from a state police vantage point, it's uh, going very well. Um, just looking at numbers, year one compared to, uh, to year two, 
Um, as with anything, it seems like as time goes on, our calls for service across the board uh, in Waterbury and across um, the entire Middlesex coverage area increases. Um, no change for, for Waterbury. So uh, year one to year two, the calls for service overall um, increased uh, just slightly, um, just about just over 200 calls per service uh, more uh, year two versus year one. Um, about 50 more of those cases were uh, criminal investigations, um, a noticeable increase uh, in arrests between uh, the two years. Uh, the first year that we were uh, that we did the contract, um, 85 arrests. Year two, we had 122 arrests, and uh, just a handful more of drug violations. Um, from a motor vehicle standpoint, obviously, uh, year one, we we I think we did a, a pretty good stroke of business, and we more than well just about doubled the amount of tickets. Uh, our warnings went down, our traffic stops, um, just about doubled traffic stops, just to give, put some emphasis on the numbers, uh, went from just under 400, 397 traffic stops in year one to just over 700 traffic stops in year two. Um, and with that noticeable uh, increase in presence, um, your uh, overall rate of crashes reduced as well for, uh, for Waterbury overall. Um, so again, I think from a state police standpoint, it's certainly uh, working out well. Uh, the, uh, the COVID crisis pandemic um, really put a, a damper on, on things, um, obviously mid 2020 uh, with the state police, we went, um, into a, a modified service uh, level, um, just trying to limit our interaction with, uh, with anyone, uh, especially in the, the early months of COVID. Um, so a lot of our proactive work across the board um, was all but uh, completely, um, it just didn't happen. Uh, we did a lot of things um, a lot of the initial calls for service, um, we would take over the phone and then take a good hard look to see if it's something that we needed to respond to. Obviously, if it required a response, we responded. Um, but those were obviously some of the, uh, some of the challenges that we faced in early COVID. We've backed off that, um, just a little bit, but, uh, at the same time, we're still being cautious, um, and, and how we respond and what we respond to. Uh, motor vehicle stops. Um, there, there's still we still continue to to stop vehicles. Um, our water barrier guys are are I feel are, are doing a good job, um, but they they have decreased some just just based on the state police COVID protocols that uh, obviously they have to to fall in line with. Um, and obviously, you guys, everyone knows as well as I do, we have no idea where this is gonna go and how long it, it will linger. Um, so we're just kind of uh, along for the ride like everyone else. Um, other, than, other than that, um, one, one challenge that we are gonna face moving into uh, 2021 with the Waterbury um, contract is the, uh, the day shift trooper. Keith Luia, uh, he is in the National Guard and he is potentially scheduled to deploy. So still trying to sort out when and uh, pretty much when that will happen. And then um, we'll have to determine how we, how we move forward uh, from, from there. Good, well, thank you, Dave. And I think the, I think the, uh the graphics that Mark helped put together really points out uh, how activities and interaction with the public really, really dropped off to almost nothing in April. Uh, that's clear on the information that you have in front of you. Um, select board, if you have any 
questions or comments, certainly feel free to uh, speak up now. And Mark, I know you're not a select board member anymore, but you do put these numbers together for me. So if there's any observations that you want to share and see, certainly from my perspective, feel free to uh, interject and add that. So select board members, uh, Dave is here to answer your questions if you have any. How do we feel um, that we're addressing the concerns of citizens with some of those speed areas that it seemed to come up through the summer? Do we feel like um, call volume has gone down with complaints in that regard and feeling like we're able to um, help reduce some of that um, concern? Well, I'll take that from my perspective right now. Uh, these things are cyclical. Um, and with social media, of course, uh, sometimes there tends to be a feeding frenzy. And if one person complains, then somebody else feels free to complain. And then before you know it, you know, you've got a couple of weeks going where there's a lot of uh, uh, comments and a lot of concerns being expressed. We heard this year from folks uh, who came to select board meetings, uh, people from uh, Little River Road uh, came to some of our Zoom meetings, people from Stowe Street, and to a lesser degree for a different issue, people from Blush Hill. And the Blush Hill was mainly with regard to, to parking and, and how voters at the reservoir were impacting the road. Um, the state police were very proactive in especially the uh, Little River concerns. Uh, anytime people reached out to me to, to complain, I asked them, you know, have you called the state police to report your concerns to them? They're the agency that really uh, is the, you know, boots on the ground, the wheels on the road, whatever the uh, phrase you want to use is. And if you call them, and express concerns, you know, they log that and, and, and they'll do, do something with it. And I know the troopers were instrumental in getting um, one of the feedback uh, radar signs there. And that was a state police sign that was, that was put down there. From that, we uh, used that information when we dealt with the people from Stowe Street. And since we have bought two additional uh, radar feedback signs that we're moving around the community. Uh, it's mainly been on Stowe Street and on Winooski Street, uh, in addition to the you know two permanent ones that we have on Stowe Street up uh, as you come down the hill before you get to Tannery Flats. But the, uh, the portable one has been placed uh, a little bit closer to the school, mainly in the direction from Route 100 toward the school and the other one's been on Winooski Street. So that's my perspective. We're getting far fewer complaints now. I don't know if that means people are happy or they're just tired of complaining, but they're, they're not contacting me to the degree that they were before. And I'm not sure what the Lieutenant knows about any of this, but that's my perspective. Yeah, I would say just uh, from from our perspective, you know, just looking through the the general calls for service, um, you know, I, I think the the overall you know motor vehicle complaints from from that sort of standpoint, from speeding and things like that, I think that that uh, they they have gone down. And again, like Mr. Shep, like said, whether that's because people just got tired of complaining or we're actually making a difference, but um, I, uh, I I think that anything, well, actually, certainly anything that comes in gets gets uh, addressed immediately. I know any time that uh, Mr. Sheplak gets something, he forwards it to me, and I immediately forward it to the troopers, and I I almost always get a, a response back where they get right on it. So um, I think visibility says says a lot about uh, all of these things. Yeah, and from my perspective, uh, I appreciate the responsiveness of, of Lieutenant White. He is really my contact. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the first 
troopers that we had here uh, who hit retirement age, unfortunately. Um, he, when he took this position, he really, you know, kind of reached out to the local staff. I think he may have reached out to some of the select board members uh, and was very uh, active in terms of his uh, wanting to communicate with, with uh, me. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm not making a value judgment on the current troopers, but their um, MO, their operation in terms of how they do their day-to-day -day work is a little different. And, and they do not um, reach out to me directly. And I respect the chain of command that we have with the state police when we entered into this agreement uh, I was told that, you know, if there were concerns or problems or requests that they should go through Lieutenant White. And, and he is uh, my, my point of contact. And uh, on uh, the rare occasion when we did have this situation going on up with the folks uh, camping up on the ledges up uh, between Thatcher Brook and the interstate ramp, uh, you know, I reached out to Lieutenant White and I had a little bit of contact with some of the troopers that were involved in that just because that was a specific incident that they were responding to. But Lieutenant White has been very responsive to me um, and how the community feels about it. Um, you know, you probably, as a select board members, you probably get more feedback than I do from the citizenry as a whole. I'll take a stab at it. Uh... Lieutenant White, this is Chris Viennes. Um, apologize to everybody for really spacing on this meeting tonight. Uh, I just got ahead of myself on something else and forgot all about it. But uh, I guess my question, Lieutenant, it would be a couple of things. Um, when speed patrols are conducted, are they uh, Basically, at random during any portion of the day, or is there consideration uh, during commuting times when, especially coming home at night, um, when people seem to be most impatient and uh, don't care who's in the way, but their you know their main concern is to get home. Um, the other question is: Is there a possibility? I don't know what's entailed. You have to explain it to me. Of switching up um, some of the hourly schedule, be able to maybe change one weekday for one weekend day, maybe a couple times a month. Because um, right now, I think the citizen citizenry around here has a pretty cl clear indication that you know there's not much police activity on the weekends. And that seems to be when most of the uh, higher rate of speed takes place, especially, you know, on uh, the roads by my place here on the own flats and up the road and uh, other areas up here in the center. Uh, so the, for the first question, I mean, if there is a specific concern somewhere that, that uh, we know about, we'll definitely direct attention to that. Um, and if there's a, a specific time that's that's known um, to be a problem in a certain area, if if we know about that, if the if the troopers know that there's an issue, they they will focus uh, their their activity um, in those areas on those times. Uh, otherwise, they're out patrolling and responding to calls for service. So um, a lot of their patrol work probably depends on their comings and goings uh from those areas where the the calls for service are um in terms of switching up the the days um i would have to look back uh at the contract um uh, i think the initial contract was for a specific uh day shift monday through friday and uh, an, an evening shift tuesday through saturday uh, but not having the contract in front of me, I would have to refer back to that to see uh, if there is um, any sort of leniency within within the verbiage. Okay, that, that, I guess that's my question more or less is uh, would there be a consideration if the board 
had any interest in it, uh, maybe change that up a little little bit so we could get you know, a couple days a, a month during on a weekend day, uh, specifically more more or less Saturday. Um, yeah, Sunday. Yeah, and I, I would I would tend to you know uh, agree with that. Um, just uh, simply because I know I would be open to that, just because I see the numbers um, and. I see how the those numbers obviously increase. You know the the traffic through Waterbury um, can double, triple, and quadruple on any given Leaf Peeper weekend. Uh, so especially during the during the daytime. So um, I'm definitely not opposed to it. Um, obviously the the troopers that are working the contracts uh, entered into that under under certain um, you know under certain guidelines that, that this work would be specifically within these days. So again, I, I would, I would just have to have to look at, at how that contract is, is worded and, and what we can do, but I'm, I'm certainly um, open to, uh, to going down that road and, and seeing what we can, what we can come up with. Cause ultimately, you know, you, uh, you guys are, are the customer to the Vermont state police. So, if we can better our service, uh, it's certainly something that I'm open to. Did you understand what I asked him, Bill? I think so. And I don't, you know, maybe even going as far as saying, uh, is is there a way of switching one of, and again, I'm just inquiring, uh, is there a way of switching day or two a month with one of the full-time officers that Waterbury employs Perhaps another officer from Middlesex that he works more weekends. Whether or not you could switch out a day uh, instead of instead of changing the current officers. Yeah, I, I don't have the contract in front of me either, and I know there's something in there. You know, we asked about the hours of operation. That was a concern of the select board when when we started the contract, and I, I don't remember what time the trooper starts in the morning. But you know, we did ask that if from time to time we wanted the trooper to come in a little bit earlier to you know catch some um, you know maybe early morning people going to work every once in a while, so it was not always exactly you know clockwork when they were going to be out there. And that was something that the the state police um, hierarchy that was involved in writing the contract said that they would be open to, but it would have to go through, you know, Lieutenant White. And this it's a little different than the question that you're asking, Chris. And I think we can look at the contract just to remind everyone. Um, you know, we have had two full years of this contract plus now. The contract uh, expires on June 30th of, of 2021. So we need to do a couple things. We need to look at the contract and we can look at you know how the services are provided and whether we can get a little bit more flexibility like Chris is suggesting and that uh, Lieutenant White seems to think might be beneficial from time to time, given how uh, uh, you know the weekends are very different from a, a weekday, um, especially in the high tourism times of year. But we're also going to have to kind of touch base pretty quickly with the state to, to see what their appetite for continuing this contract is. And I don't know if Lieutenant White is in a position to speak to that or not. I won't put him on the spot, but um, you know the contract does expire on the 30th of June, so we're going to have to make some um, some reaching out to the state to see whether or not they're open to continuing this. From my point of view, I think it's a great contract. I think it provides good service to us at a very reasonable cost um you know it's three hundred and sixty five thousand dollars a year so it's a thousand dollars a day basically but having um having been the manager for the village and seeing the police department and the costs that they had and the, the personnel 
um, you know, challenges with that. Uh, I think this is a good deal for us still. And I, I hope that we can work things out that it can continue, just speaking for myself. Well, as part of your question, Bill, maybe I'll add a little bit more to it. Um, and I think I talked to you about this earlier on uh, a couple weeks ago, but um, my question was moving the barracks to uh, Berlin, yeah, how would that impact you know, the relationship uh, as we have it now? Well, I think that's a better question for Lieutenant White. Um, that's, yeah, that's why. By and large, the, the agreement is that for all intents and purposes, when these officers are on duty and assigned to Waterbury, they're in Waterbury. Now, I know they have to go back to the barracks, especially if there's an arrest and things like that. And Berlin is, is certainly a little bit further away, but I think that, that question is really more for Lieutenant White. Yeah, and that would um, that would that would be the 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 biggest thing um, on the occasion when they when they do need to to go to the barracks when they have to process someone uh, when they have to interview someone. Obviously, that that journey from Waterbury to to Berlin is is now extended, but um, the yeah the obviously moving moving my location will not uh have any effect on the relationship that myself and mr Sheplek have from from my vantage point and it would just uh extend the the amount of time that the that the troops are are out of waterbury to to do those those small things um and you know there there may be uh you know if if we do move forward um with another contract and Mr. Shep, like I'd love to think I had that kind of power, but I do not. <laughs> so, um, but uh, you know, moving forward, there there could be some some talk about um, you know having having some sort of uh, a, a, a better utilized space, maybe at the fire department or something, um, with uh, with a printer or with you know something like that set up so that it's it's you know, just uh, to print or copy or, you know, do something like that. Um, perhaps it's, it's not, uh, you know, we, we would only need to go to the barracks for processing and, and things like that. Um, you know, it may be something where we're, we have a, a regular relay of, of paperwork or information if, if they do have to print something off at the barracks remotely and we can relay it up. So, I mean, it's certainly, Certainly, something that uh, that we can look at and talk about in the future. Lieutenant White, this is uh, Mike Bard. I just want to uh, briefly talk about one. I think this is a really good model contract that I know I spoke up. You know, we had a conversation up at Deer Camp, and there were several uh, police from out of state, and they thought. The idea of small police departments are very hard to manage, and I think this is a really good model that you know maybe you know can be pursued you know in other places. Going on again, again we probably hear more things about the quality of life things, such as um, you know speeding and stuff like that. We kind of talked about. But I want to go in a little different area. Uh, statewide, you know, we have a uh, epidemic of, you know, opioid and stuff like that. How would you rate the Waterbury community in terms of, you know, addiction rates and or possibly, uh, is there much evidence of, um, you know, dealing of narcotics, you know, in our community? Um, from from that vantage point, based on the the information, uh, the, the drug involved, um, investigations and, and things that at least that we're aware of and that we've responded to um there's let me see if i can pull it up uh while i'm sitting here because i was just looking at it um your your drug violations so that's that's drug arrests um well for the for year one and year two are 20 um so i would say that waterbury is doing a pretty good job in terms of of uh avoiding uh that that instance um 
and you know could there could there be a lot of things that certainly go go unreported uh so therefore unnoticed by us absolutely but i can tell you that uh there are much smaller communities throughout central vermont who have much larger problems that uh that we respond to on a regular basis okay that's good to know thank you much certainly Any other select board members got any questions? Uh, yeah, so when when would we have to start talking about like really diving into the terms of this contract? Like when is when is that need to be finalized by? We're gonna, you know, I'll, I will reach out um, to um, to the contact folks that I have with regard to the contract relatively soon. Uh, we're really going to need to know from our perspective um, as best we can by January. Now, the state police clearly have a different um, uh, budget year than we have. They're on a uh, July 1st to June 30th year. That's why the contract is uh, got a, a June 30th expiration date. And um, you know they're going to need the legislature to uh, make appropriations for their budget, and you know whether they uh, are agreeable to continue to uh, to have this uh, contract. Um, you know it's all subject to uh, the legislative process as well. But from our standpoint, we're going to try to work things out and at least get pricing in place so we have it for our town meeting and then um you know we'll have to just kind of cross our fingers and see what happens with the uh, with the legislature and you know the the uh, civilian administration of the department of public safety you know they'll have to weigh in and you know like like every uh, government entity they have competing interests and uh, we'll just have to see where it, where Chris, can I make a couple of observations? Go ahead, shoot, Mark. Okay. Um, the uh, statistical stuff that, that Bill had mentioned, the, uh, the graphic um, portrayal that I put together, in, over the last two years, you can really see the consistency in, in what's there. And the way that's put together is really to try to give you a picture of uh, the type of calls and the type of services that are being provided. And also we wanted to look at when we initially started, how much of the workload was being covered by the troopers that are assigned to Waterbury and how much are covered out of the Middlesex station directly. And over time, um, that's running pretty much about a 50-50. Um, you have to keep in mind that the town is paying for 80 hours of coverage and there are more than 80 hours in a week. Um, so the fact that the, the resident troopers are picking up 50% of the workload um, is, is actually pretty good bang for the buck. Um, the other thing that I've seen, and Chris, this kind of goes back to your concern with the, um, uh, with the shift coverage stuff is that, and I'll let Lieutenant White speak to this as well, but it seems as though with the resident troopers here and their presence here, it's been a relief for the rest of the troopers at the Middlesex station. So they, um, they've generally um, uh, provided favorable feedback on the fact that we are supporting the two troopers to cover the workload here in Waterbury. We're averaging anywhere between 80 and 100 plus calls a month. And uh, half of that is being covered right with the uh, two troopers that are assigned. So that's a, that's a good relief for the station troopers at Middlesex. Um, but it also seems to generate a lot of interest in 
some of the other troopers providing patrol coverage when um, they are covering for the Waterbury troops not being around. Um, I think there's a, a good relief factor to the fact that we've got full-time assigned people here so that even if a station trooper is covering something, if there's a need for additional follow-up and everything, we've got people that are assigned here that will, will cover that responsibility pretty well. Plus they know the community um, and that's the important thing. But going back to what Bill had mentioned earlier, um, uh, Rick was the uh, first trooper that you were talking about, Bill. And he, he made a, a good point of connecting with uh, the business community, um, town officials and the like. And that's really the role of uh, the day shift trooper. Um, our night shift uh, trooper, he's just, he's showing up and he's working at a time where uh, a lot of the contacts are just no longer available. Uh, it's great to hear that Lieutenant White has maintained that close contact with Bill and that's, a, that's an integral part of it. The commitment from the station supervisory staff is critical to the success of this project. And to this point, it really has worked well. Um, to Mark's, um, Mike's comments about uh, the model that's being used here, there are several communities around the state yeah, that envy the working relationship that we have. And this project was really intended to be that, that pilot um, to see whether or not it was a viable uh, model to follow, to replicate in some other communities. So in addition to simply renewing the Waterbury one, uh, the department I'm sure is gonna be looking at the prospect of whether or not they replicate this in other communities. Um, it, it certainly has provided stable coverage for us and it has uh, lessened some of the management headaches that may have been in place previously. Yeah, that was my uh, main, main uh, attraction to this model from the get-go when it was originally brought to the table along with the uh, proposal for townwide police was the fact that you know from a state's perspective to add a, two additional troopers I believe it was uh, 15 troopers for covering 18 towns if I'm correct and uh, you know now we've gone to 20 troopers, I suspect. Um, if you wanted to knock off, or I mean, I'm sorry, 17 troopers and take one of those 18 towns that they would have covered under the 15 trooper model, take that away. So now there, there are 15 troopers covering 17 towns as opposed to 18 with two additional troopers for backup if necessary. So I don't know that anybody's asked Lieutenant White this question, but has there been any conversation uh, of uh, using this model in other towns throughout the state, Lieutenant? Uh, yes, this is um, this is an ongoing conversation, um, and just as, just as uh, several of you have mentioned, it's definitely um, a very good model. Uh, pretty much right from the get go, when when I took over here. Uh, the, the conversations throughout multiple towns, um, especially those immediately surrounding Waterbury, uh, Richmond um, was, was certainly one that was a, was a big talk, uh, but there's, there's a lot of people that have and continue to keep an eye on how this Waterbury contract goes, um, just because uh, with the collaboration between state police and the local municipality and uh, working so closely and so well together, um, it, it seems to be a, a good fix and a, a good possible solution for, uh, for a lot of smaller communities or even larger communities that have uh, a smaller municipal police department. And just to, you know, obviously it's, it's very, very enticing to, to be able to have, have that coverage and none of the headaches that go along with, uh, with all of the, with all of that. So um, it's definitely a, a good model. And I know, I'm not sure, obviously, uh, the, what the higher ups are, are looking at, whether it's 
they're looking at other other uh, communities to to get involved with. But um, I know there's a there's a lot a lot of emphasis on how well this contract goes, uh, just for for future for future ventures. I would think that uh, other municipalities that are fairly close within the proximity of uh, barracks throughout the state. I don't know how many sets of barracks you have, two or three. Um, but if you can surround yourself with other towns that perhaps use the same model, that relieves additional officers um, to put back in these further towns that you, it's more difficult to reach on a timely basis, um, may be able to concentrate more in, in those areas uh, for more. Yeah, certainly it allows the, the state police to, to give a more concentrated um, effort to individual individual communities while also increasing our um, our number of troopers that are actually out on the road, which increases visibility across the state. Um, you know, so just just adding a, a couple of more bodies does does a world of difference um, across the across the state. So I would like to mention one more thing and then probably not enough. Um, we had a debate today on WTV for representatives running for House of Representatives positions. Um, I brought to the table uh, consideration that instead of uh, we got talking about the defunding police or that topic came up real briefly. And I said, right from uh, you know this racial equity thing and the problems we've had, Black Lives Matter concerns, all that. And rather than defunding the police, I suggested that we seg help segregate, try to segregate the state police more, uh, bring in more people of minority in into the state police positions and somehow allow them to deal with um, minority phone calls, minority calls, you know, calls that came in that uh, um, were minority minority related and be able to send these minority troopers to deal with that rather than uh, the troopers that have been doing it and then maybe take out this racial card uh, problem. Uh, do you think there's any capability of that happening or What's the potential of that? Uh, I I think just from a overarching uh, view, uh, simply getting any qualified candidate uh, wanting to do this job right now is is difficult. Uh, trying to um, diversify our membership has been something that uh, we've been we've been attempting to do for for years now, and it's just a matter of of finding the people that that want to do the job. It's not a Certainly not a, a lack of, of effort on our recruiting division. It's just a matter of um, really finding anyone that's that's capable and uh, and wanting to do this job. Um, period. Yeah, that was, that was was going to be one of my questions. Uh, recruiting. Okay. All right. If uh, we're all done with Lieutenant White. Probably can let him the rest of the night off if there's any more questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lieutenant. Um, to the select board members, I assume based on the comments made that um, there is an appetite for keeping this contract going into the future that we're, you know, the, the contract, as I said, is going to expire and, and no one is wanting to not have this contract, right? You can't make the state do it, but we're going to ask. Is that the direction you want to give me? I give you I a thumbs up. So, yeah, I think it would be a real I, shame to lose it. I do too. I think uh, we don't want to go backwards. As I kind of said, you're seeing small police departments. It's the economy of scale of having a small police department is very inefficient it, and it doesn't provide good policing. And I think. You know, that's what everyone wants. You know, I know this whole defunding the police, but I think this is a model, and I know I want to go forward. I think this is a great idea, and I think more communities are probably going to want to go this way. 
Yeah, I'll say that I'm in support of a continuation of the contract, but I would like to at some point have a discussion on, you know, what services we aren't getting because of the, the type of contract we're doing, um, you know, parking. There's definitely a list of items that, you know, um, we didn't expect going into this contract that we were going to receive, but um, there's definitely things that, you know, a local police department um, has done in the past or maybe could or should have been doing that this contract doesn't fulfill. So I think at some point we really do need to talk through the things that maybe we're missing and, and how we backfill those with, you know, whatever we need to do. But um, I, I support the continuation. Hey. Yep, I'm in support and um, thank you for your service. I'm sorry about the recruitment. <laughs> um, I know my grandfather's been trying to get me to go into that kind of, you know, future. He used to be a captain in the state police, but, you know, I appreciate the work you do and thank you. Okay, to Lieutenant White, uh, thanks for showing up and uh, answering all our questions. All right, folks, thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, good luck with your continued meeting and I uh, hope all of you stay well. Have a good night. Uh, good night. Thank you, you as well. Mark, uh, Mark Fryer, um, I didn't mean to take over the meeting here. Uh, you're welcome to continue running it if you want to. No, you're, you're fine, I'll pass it off. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll talk uh, about an interview for DRB alternative, uh, alternate term ending April 30th, 2021. Who might that be? That's me. George? Yep. Okay. Interested in jumping in the hot seat on the DRB, huh? That, that's right, the last, the last one. <laughs> well, what piqued your interest about that? Um, well, I went through the process uh, this spring, and um, I'm a I'm a civil engineer, environmental engineer now, and uh, so I've I've been on the other side of the the table many times, and uh, I I sort of realized that this is a way for me to give back to my community and in, in an area that I'm familiar with, and. Um, and also realized if I want to, you know, keep Waterbury this great place that I like to live, that that joining the development review board would be a way to keep doing that. Obviously, your engineering background uh, you have some sense of uh, what you'd be dealing with. Yep. Yes, indeed. Um, was this an advertised position, Carla? All the positions are advertised uh, at the town meeting sometime in April. Okay. Yeah. Um, board members, you'd like to ask any questions? Seeing as how we got two board members that were previous DRB members, uh, they ought to be full of questions for you. <laughs> so, George, you really uh, don't have anything else to do on Wednesday evenings? <laughs> I was, I was putting the, the meetings into my calendar today and I, I sort of had a, oh boy. No, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, no, it's, it, it's all really interesting to me. That's great. Um, and I think, uh, you know, between you and, and the current chair, there's a, there's a wealth of, of knowledge there on the, um, you know, on the engineering and the, um, and the permitting side of things. And um, uh, what is your um, what is your position on on Waterbury and um, things like historic preservation and um, <clears throat> you know uh, we're doing a big rewrite of all of our zoning laws right now and and what's what's kind of the what what's kind of your uh, interest there. Um, I, I think the, the historic preservation piece is, is hugely important, um, especially in this state. And it's, it's, uh, I started my career in Wyoming, which is interesting because everything's new construction. There's very, very little, um, historic anything. Um, so I think it's, it's important to preserve that, but, 
not at the expense of um, of new development and improvements. And I always think back to I went to UVM and um, Vody Hall, which is the engineering building, is on the 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 list of historic places in Burlington, and it's in my opinion, a really ugly building, but it, it precluded them from making necessary improvements to the engineering building. Um, so we were, we were left with some out of date labs and some out of date equipment and that sort of thing. So I definitely think it's important to preserve the historic nature of, of things, but not necessarily at the expense of, of progress. Great. Well, I think that the uh, DRB would be lucky to have you. I wish you luck. Thank you. Steve, you popped in on it there for a second. Did you have something you wanted to add? Or... Yeah, uh, no, we're, we're just, oh, were you asking me, Chris? Yes, I was talking to you. Yeah, Steve. sure. Well, I'm just grateful that uh, George is willing to step up and uh, I don't really have any questions. Um, I wanted to let the board know that one of our members, uh, Andrew Straninski, is in the process of moving, moving to Southern Vermont. So we, we're gonna have an opportunity for uh, one of the alternates to step up as a regular member. But also wanted to let you know that our alternates are very active on the board. Uh, if, as long as uh, one or two of our members uh, are absent, we encourage alternates to participate. So uh, just giving you a heads up, uh, George, we're gonna welcome your involvement. That's all I have, Chris. Okay, Michael. Thanks. Michael, were you gonna hey, say George. something? Yeah, George, this is Mike Bard. Uh, I'm also a former uh, long time DRB member. And one thing, thank you for stepping up for your service. I think the DRB is one of the more important uh, committees that we have in the community. Uh, let me ask you, this is something that always kind of bothered me on the DRB and still is probably not that rectified. How would you work to correct, because there have been a number of, you know, permit conditions that we've had, uh, you know, installed and some of the applicants over a long period of time have not complied with this the permit conditions. How would you deal with uh, in enforcement actions of the RB uh, findings. Wow. Um, it's a tough one. I threw, I threw you a fastball. <laughs> and not, not, uh, not something I was uh, necessarily anticipating, but I guess my, my initial reaction is to, to um, you know, require corrective action. Um, I mean, unless unless there's 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 good reason for for not adhering to permit conditions. Um, I mean, you think of an engineer puts design plans to together, and you know if if they spec number eight rebar and you you put something else in, it's it's non-compliance, and you have to fix it, or you have to come up with a, a different solution that's still going to be appropriate. Um, so I, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to me at least uh, in in the little bit of research I've done thus far that there's really an an avenue to follow through or or you know require people to to be in conformance. So I'm, I'm not sure how you would how you would even pursue that. But I guess the the short answer to your question is is. Yes, it's important, and and the the situation should be rectified. You're saying and the regulations might need some more teeth. It's it's a difficult question, and yes, yeah, probably the regulations do need some more teeth. But I I think your background is very uniquely suited for um, inclusion on the DRB, and it's always good to have you know a number of different kind of skill sets on on the DRB. From of legal to engineering skill set to just real real life, you know, it's a good to have to make some people on that DRB and I think you you'd be a good addition. Prior, any questions? Thanks, Mike. Comments? Nope. Katie, sounds like you're good too as well. 
I'm good. Okay. All right. So we won't belabor the issue any longer. Uh, if somebody'd like to make a motion to uh, nominate George Lester as an alternate for the DRB term ending April 30th, 2021, you can move ahead. I'll make a motion to uh, approve George to the DRB. Your second. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, hearing none. All those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Welcome aboard, George. Thank you very much. And, and Good luck. You'll have fun. Enjoy your term. All righty. Steve, are you about the grant application for the Vermont Urban Community and, and Community Forestry? Yes, that's me. So, um, absolutely. So I sent out a uh, bunch of materials on Friday and uh, hopefully you all receive them. Uh, Bill and I have been working together for a while on our um, approach to the emerald ash borer, which is a, um, a pest that uh, you've probably heard about. It's uh, been found in Montpelier at the National Life Building. It's um, a bug which um, has now been found in um, quite a few Vermont communities. It started in uh, the towns of Barrie and Orange and has since um, covered uh, much of the geographic area. So it's not very far away. Um, it's a bug which uh, once, once it's infested ash trees in an area, it, um, it's deadly and ultimately will uh, kill out uh, most of the ash. So other areas of the country have experienced uh, a lot of uh, devastation, if you will. Luckily, only about 5% um, of our woodland woodlands are ash trees, but um, on the other hand, we have a lot of ash in our roadside areas. We did an inventory last year of uh, about 11 miles of um, wooded roadside area with the Central Mont Regional Planning Commission. We found over 650 ash trees and um, we found a couple of or uh, several pockets where the ash are in poor condition. We found a few that are dead that are quite large. So the state has a grant program to uh, address the uh, removal of roadside ash trees. And um, we'd like to uh, make an application to that program. It's due at the end of October. And uh, there are two parts to this grant uh, program. One is the removal of roadside ash. And then the other is a, a complementary planting of, um, of trees. They do not have to be in the same area, uh, but it would need to be either in a public right of way or on public property. So the, um, the areas that we'd like to address for removal are going to be on uh, Maggie's Way where there's um, a dead ash and a number that are in poor condition. Uh, Greg Hill Road where we have a couple dead ash and some, some in poor condition and Shaw Mansion Road. So um, this is really going to be an annual program, but we'd like to start with, uh, but with funds that we, um, we have budgeted this year for the uh, town uh, highway department and for the cemetery and cemeteries. And um, a Bill, I think is gonna address the, um, the budget issue here shortly. Uh, but I just wanted to outline the, the um, complementary planting. Our tree committee has been very active and we've been uh, uh, working with um, the cemetery uh, commissioners, Jack Carter, who's a cemetery commissioner is on our tree committee and we coordinate with John Woodruff and um, we've started coordinating with the cemetery commissioners to do a planting in Hope Cemetery. And uh, you probably noticed on Winooski Street, there was a um, uh, hedge, if you will, of uh, cedar trees, very large cedars that were overgrown and filled with uh, weed trees that were removed this past summer. And that's the area we'd like to do a planting. So I sent, sent you a planting plan. It's really conceptual at this point. We're gonna work with the cemetery commissioners 
on refining this plan, make sure that they uh, like it. And um, in the meantime, uh, we can apply uh, with your uh, authorization. I would like to apply for $6,500 in grant funds uh, through the state um, uh, Department of um, Forest Parks and Recreation, their urban forestry program. And it uh, requires an equal match. Uh, we currently have $6,500 uh, in our uh, FY20 budget that um, is split between the highway department, uh, the tree maintenance line there is 4,000 and the cemetery budget the tree maintenance line there is 2,500. So what we'd be looking for is a, uh, I believe a commitment to uh, rebudget those funds for next year, and we would use that as the uh, match. Uh, we also happen to have a, a $2,000 private donation that um, came from John Woodruff's uncle, uh, in memory of his wife. And um, I won't go into all the details. He, he's an interesting fellow. He uh, grew up here and then went to Alaska and had a career as an attorney in Alaska and uh, has made that commitment so we, we, we may use a portion of those funds to help with this project. And uh, with that, Bill, do you want to talk a little bit more about the budgeting side of this? Uh, Steve's really has hit the highlights. I think the um, main thing is that <clears throat> this grant opportunity requires a 50% match. Uh, budgeting 6,500 between the highway fund and, and the cemetery gets us 65%, I mean, gets us $6,500. Uh, so it'd be a $13,000 project. Um, I think that's a reasonable amount of money to ask for. Um, I think the limit is, you said 15, Steve? That's correct, Bill. <laughs> but grant. While, while the maximum grant is uh, allowed up to 15,000, there's a statewide limit that you know, they're not going to be able to give $15,000 to every community that might ask. Um, the donation that Steve talked about, just so everyone's clear, that was a donation that was made to the cemetery fund. It's an unrestricted donation, uh, but it was basically made when uh, the gentleman saw the uh, area where the cedars had been taken down. What was going to be happening there in the future. So um, he, uh, he did make a $2,500 donation, which is in the cemetery fund now. And this project is will be two-pronged. I, I think that the planting plan that Steve sent you is clearly for the cemetery. Um, but the, the removal of trees is going to be happening mainly on the highway rights of way, Steve, correct? Correct, Bill. Okay. Right. They're roadside ash within our uh, right of way, correct? Right. So, um, as Steve indicated, we did have um, uh, a plan that was produced. We did an inventory, and this is the first step of kind of implementing a plan to deal with the ash trees. It's a good opportunity. I think that uh, we would be remiss not to. Uh, seek the funding because we're already putting $6,500 into our budget. Um, we might as well use that and hope that we can leverage that to get an additional $6,500 to allow us to do some more of this work. Well, Steve, I need to pick your brain a little bit about the ASH program. Sure. Um, how many trees are we talking about total? Any idea? Well, the, the number we inventoried in the town road rights of ways was a little over 650. Um, it does not include ash trees that are under the utility lines, Green Mountain Power and uh, Consolidated and um, Comcast. So those trees are the responsibility of the utility companies. And I believe uh, Bill told me that there's a surcharge that they're uh, now assessing to help with a program to remove ash in um, utility rights of ways. So these are freestanding ash. We'd have to hire an arborist to take them down. But um, right now, the vast majority of our trees are actually in good condition, our ash trees in the roadside. So we're really trying to get proactive, uh, remove some. We'll, we'll check them when they come down, make sure uh, 
you know, if there are any ash borer present, that, that that's uh, reported to the state. Um, but uh, right now, uh, probably 80% or more of our roadside ash are in, are in good healthy condition. So we're anticipating eventually they'll, it'll get here and it will decline rapidly. Are we removing them because they're public safety hazards or are we removing them just because they're dead and, and uh, they may be contaminated with the ash borer? Well, it's really for both reasons. Um, Ash, as you know, Chris, you've done a lot of work in the woods. Ash is a very brittle wood. And once it dies, uh, it tends to shatter when it falls. It's uh, expensive to take down uh, for, you know, for a tree uh, company. And once they're dead, so it's really better. The state is recommending that municipalities become proactive and remove ash, you know, once they're going into a poor condition and uh, it's cheaper that way. And um, I think we're gonna advocate for an annual program to try to stay ahead of the curve. But the focus will be only on tr trees that are dead that, uh, that I would call hazard trees just because they're gonna be prone to breakage and um, coming down in windstorms and so on. And the ones that are in poor condition that have dead limbs and so on that are gonna come down in the windstorm as well. What happens to the wood uh, to, to uh contain the spread of, if there is a emerald ash borer indications in the wood, uh, does the wood stay local? Or does the arborist take it off, chuck it off somewhere? Um, right, it has to be, uh, if it's invested. And owners get it, what? Right, so the first offer is to give it to the homeowner. Uh, that's the state guidance. Um, and then if the homeowner doesn't want it, uh, we would need to find a stockpile area, uh, one of our material storage areas. And it can be moved in the winter when the ash borer is dormant, but there's guidance on um, you know, how it can be utilized. Uh, firewood certainly from those trees cannot be uh, transported um, you know, any distance. So if we do find it, then we'll, we'll seek guidance, but that's the requirement either. It is uh, first offered to the homeowner, adjacent landowner, uh, second goes into a stockpile area, and then there's a plan for um, utilizing that wood. So if we get the grant, we'll, uh, Bill and I will work with Celia and Bill Woodruff to um, have a plan there. Yeah, and to be pretty clear, I mean, the number of trees that we'll be able to remove with, uh, with $6,000 uh, or so is, is not, in, uh, a lot of trees. Um, you know, this is a planting project and it's a removal project, but, uh, you know, a, a big ash tree can easily be, I would imagine, a thousand dollars or more to remove. Right. Yeah. We're anticipating, you know, these, most of these trees are in the 12 to 24 inch uh, caliper size. So we're anticipating we'd probably end up removing uh, 10, give or take. Now my concern more was about possible spread of uh, the insect if uh, you know, if there wasn't some controls in place to keep the wood you know where it's, where it's locally to where it's been cut you know? right. absolutely that's the that would be the intent to keep it local right and just so you, just so you know as well um, you know there are some ash trees in the cemeteries um, the cemetery commissioners um, I think it was in 2019, uh, a year ago, um, actually had some of the trees in the Hope Cemetery inoculated. Um, there is an inoculation that you can vaccinate the tree and help it uh, gain a resistance to the ash borer beetle. And it, it's too early to tell here, but there's evidence from other places where it's been used that you know, if you have a really nice ash tree, it might be worthwhile doing this, uh, especially before the ash borer beetle gets in close proximity. So that has been done in, in Hope Cemetery. Mike Bard, you were going to say something? Uh, Steve, if, if an ash tree is shown to be negative, you know, not, not containing ash borers, and it, 
a homeowner does not want the tree, is there a possibility to sell some of the firewood to defer some of the cost of the grant for us? Uh, that's a question we can ask the state. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I know some communities have programs through nonprofit organizations to uh, split the firewood and uh, give it to low income Vermonters. So we could pursue, I, I would suggest we pursue a program of that nature. Uh, if that the, was, that was my other tack is, you know, giving it to low income in, individuals for firewood. But, you know, if there was not need there and, and we can sell it, boy, you know, that'd be a way to put money back in the town coffers. Yeah, we'll have to talk to the state and see if there's restrictions on uh, marketing the wood. I, I I can find, I can try to find that answer, Mike. Yeah, the biggest thing is that the trees have to be ash or you know, you know, negative because again, you know, I'm a big proponent of not moving trees around, you know, you know, I have a camp up in the Northeast Kingdom, you know, as much as I would like to move some of my firewood down here up to camp, I try to keep all my firewood up there local. Yeah, that would be our intent, certainly. Okay, well. We're looking for a motion to. Uh... Right, Chris. So the motion would be to, um, well, Bill, you may want to jump in on this, but to commit to the uh, $6,500, uh, budgeting the $6,500 match from the uh, town budget and to uh, authorize uh, Bill to sign the application and submit it to the state. Sound all right, Bill? Easy peasy motion. Somebody want to move that forward? I make a motion to uh, go forward with $6,500 toward the Emerald Ash Board uh, tree program and recommend that the uh, town manager enter into an application for that purpose. Okay. Uh, There's, go ahead, Bill. That's fine. Okay. Um, somebody second it? I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 You're off and running, Steve. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yep. You posted. Okay, Bill. Looks like the rest of the night's yours. Okay, um, shouldn't be too difficult. So um, we're asking the select board to um, approve the use of the PayGov, uh, which is a credit card um, payment service to allow uh, members of the public to uh, pay their zoning fees, DRB fees and the like uh, with a credit card and potentially uh, dog licenses. So we're asking you to approve the use of PayGov for zoning and related applications, uh, the fees for zoning applications and dog licenses. Uh, Carla, will, um, Carla will make a determination if authority is given whether she wants to do it. Uh, right now, we accept credit card payments for taxes from the from the town through PayGov. Uh, EFOD collects or allows people to pay water and sewer fees through PayGov. We have a different credit card system for the um, appropriation programs that works quite well. Um, there is no cost to this to the municipality. The, uh, the user, the payee, uh, pays a 3% uh, courtesy fee. So uh, there's no loss of revenue from any of these permits that are filed this way. Uh, this works quite well. We've had the PayGov for, I want to say, probably close to five years for taxes and water and sewer. Um, and uh, I think especially given COVID, uh, it's good to allow these folks to be able to make these payments remotely. Uh, 
most of our zoning and planning work still happens remotely. Uh, people can make appointments to come in to see Steve or Dina, but I would say by and large, most people are, are uh, interacting with them by phone or through the computer. And of course, the, the DRB meetings are all Zoom meetings still, correct Steve? I know the planning commission is meeting uh, in person with Zoom capability as well. So anyway, that's the recommendation to allow PayGov credit card uh, payments for uh, zoning, DRB, and dog licenses. I don't think there's probably too many concerns with that. Um, I may want to make a motion. We can jump forward there. Make a motion to uh, authorize Bill to go ahead with the pay go. Second. Uh, any complicated questions or comments? <laughs> Seeing none, hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thanks. Right, so I'm going to duck off the meeting here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Sure. Thank Welcome. Bye. Thanks, Steve. 2020 CIP status report. Yeah, so just a quick update. Um, let's see, where is it here? Hang on. There we go. Okay, can, uh, I can't see any of you. Can you still see and hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, good. So just very quickly, uh, just to let you know where we stand, um, we budgeted a half million dollars for paving and uh, we have spent about 483,000 of that. Uh, that's probably gonna be it for the year. There may be a little bit of uh, more, you know, last minute patching that we can do, but we've essentially spent our budget for paving um we're still waiting uh on revenue from the state um uh, the the paving fund was going to be um funded by a four hundred and forty seven thousand dollar transfer from the general fund and a hundred thousand dollars of pilot money was going to be going into the into the uh paving fund the state has not made their pilot payment yet. I believe they probably will. Um, and we'll probably get the full funding this year as best I understand, but um, until the check comes, I'm not gonna celebrate. Uh, and then we'll have to see about next year. I presume next year will be, will be lower. Um, on the uh, infrastructure, budget, we really pulled our horns in on that. Um, you know, we, we had uh, $429,000 budgeted um, and except for, you know, 160 of that, of that money budgeted was for Main Street. And that's really what we've done. We've spent about $125,000 to date, a little bit for, building improvements uh, at the highway garage. We had $46,000 budgeted there. Uh, we're not gonna spend all that. Um, so, and that was purposely done. We, we decided to delay many of the infrastructure projects. The highway vehicle fund, just so you know, uh, we did buy the roadside mower that we had authorized last November. We bought that early in the year um, and, and we spent the full amount on that. We got $3 left over if anybody can figure out what we can do with that three bucks for the roadside mower. Um, we just received delivery on the tandem dump truck. Um, we paid 129,000. Um, truck has been delivered to uh, Viking to have the body and the plow equipment put on. We're hopeful, but not certain that we will get the truck for, um, you know, before the uh, snow really starts to fly. 
but uh, they were a little bit behind schedule on that. Um, and let's see, we had $87,000 budgeted for a one ton truck replacement. We decided uh, earlier this year that we were not gonna go ahead and, and replace that vehicle. Unfortunately, the vehicle that we kept has developed some significant problems and is probably going to cost about $18,000 to uh, get it back on the road. But I think that in the long run, while nobody's really thrilled about having to put $18,000 into that truck that's uh, six years old, I think, um, it will, it should allow that truck now to go forward for uh, I would hope three more years anyway. So we'll come out okay. Um, you know, it would have been sad to have that uh, damage happen and then, you know, trade the truck in and lose trade in value. But I think we'll be keeping that truck. So uh, in the long run, it will probably wash more in our favor than against. On the fire department side, um, Last November, we uh, agreed to buy two fire trucks, one in uh, 2019, which we took delivery on at the end of last year. And then we ordered um, a truck for this year that was um, about that same price. Um, and that truck was delivered to the fire department last week. Um, we have not paid for it yet, but we've received the bill. The vendor allowed us to, to take the truck and get it on the road uh, and gave us a couple more weeks before we have to pay. So that was generous with him. But that will be um, about $489,000 that will be going out the door. Um, I am in the process of working up the proposals for the for the borrowing, some of these uh, purchases, the roadside mower and the fire trucks, we have borrowing authorized. Um, we talked a little bit about that in the spring. And um, I'm not sure, it'll probably be, I'm, I'm hopeful, and it looks like we're gonna be able to make it, I'm hopeful that we'll actually be able to do the borrowing in December. Um, my, my goal is always to borrow as late in the year as possible because that allows us not to have to make a payment of principal or interest until after we collect taxes in the following years. So uh, my, my hope was that we'd be able to wait until December to, to borrow that money. And it looks like we're gonna be able to make that. So anyway, um, I'm sorry I didn't send you this and if I was a little bit more up to speed I probably could figure out a way to share my screen with you but um, I think it was just as easy to go through it verbally like that so I'll stop there if you have questions I'll try to answer uh, I don't really have a question more of a comment um, just to let you know there I was up at the uh, Waterbury Center fire station there the other day uh, meeting on the skate park with Bell McDougal. And uh, when I drove by, when I drove out of the parking lot there, I kind of looked at the siding on the uh, fire station and noticed that uh, it's starting to kind of come apart a little bit. I don't know if you're aware of that. And uh, Yeah, we are. And it's something that we're talking about probably for next year's budget. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's uh, that's that uh, Hardy plank or. I think so. Um, I use that same stuff on the building that my son lives in down here at the bottom of the hill, and um, they don't recommend face nailing on that. But I'll tell you, anytime I've used it, I've used it there, and I've used it on another building of mine, and I face nailed every bit of it. Um, and uh, I haven't had any issues with it. And one thing I noticed about the stuff on the fire department, it was blind, blind nails. Uh, and it's starting to really kind of fall apart there as far as, well, I didn't know if we could go back through and 
face nail that. Um, there's a little bit of a technique to do it, but uh, whether or not we could salvage what's there for a few more years before having to do anything major to it. Well, I'll be, um, I'll be happy to talk to you at some point. Yeah. Clearly, you know a lot more about this stuff than I do. I, I think I know what uh, face nailing is, and I think I know what the other nailing is that you talked about, but I don't have any experience with it. So, But yeah, we, we do know that it's starting to show some wear and tear. We got to do something with it. And clearly, we want to do, you know, something that's as cost efficient as possible, but also maintains the building in the condition that we want it in, so. I mean, there's no sign of rot or deterioration of the actual siding itself. It's just starting to kind of fall yeah, off the building. I, I understand, I understand. But it is something that uh, I've talked about with Gary. Um, also, just so you know, um, we were, we didn't have any idea what the value of the, uh, two old fire trucks, the 20 year old fire trucks that we uh, just replaced. When we replaced the truck that we purchased last year, uh, the, the truck that was mechanically unsound, we just moved it out behind the wastewater treatment plant and left it there. Um, Pete would start it up every so often and drive it around just to keep the battery charged and stuff like that. Uh, and then the truck that we that we just replaced with the new vehicle, um, Gary uh, put the word out, and the little town of Albany, Vermont, uh, paid us ten thousand dollars for both for both trucks. So they took one, um, and they couldn't be happier. You know, I think their I think their newest truck was 1985, so now they've got a 2000, so they really went up in the world to 2000. And uh, one of them, you know, they took as a parts vehicle and they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, maybe putting some money into it. But anyway, we did get $10,000 for those two trucks. It was better than having to salvage them, so. Uh, that's what you call good old Vermont do, make do live in here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, any other questions on that stuff? No. All right, good. Good. Thank you. Um, and let me see the last thing here. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong icon. Um, health insurance. So, yeah, I sent you a memo um, about health insurance for 2021. Uh, Full disclosure, the EFUD commissioners met uh, Wednesday last week. I presented this same memo to them and they approved my recommendation. Um, I, I don't wanna read the whole memo again. Compared to last year when the uh, rate increases from the uh, insurance companies were above 13% and even using, uh, you know, Inflation in the 50-50 weighting would have got our cost down to a 7.5% increase. We ended up offering the employees a 4.6% increase last year, putting a lot more weight on um, the cost of living. Uh, I'm recommending 3% this year uh, with full knowledge that that is above the cost of living. But um, as I indicated, uh, no employees in 2020 have received a raise. And uh, just, you know, anecdotally, I talked to a couple of the employees and they very much appreciate the benefit that we offer. So I think this is not a budget buster for 2021. And I think it goes a long way to, uh, to continuing to show the employees that uh, we, we do, appreciate their work and, and our concern for them. So that's my recommendation. I know uh, many of you out there in the private sector would love to have this. Uh, I get it, but um, I, I think it's I think it's the right thing to do for for 2021. Go ahead, Mark. Our mic. 
Yes. Um, just one question, Bill. Uh, I'm, ba I'm basically in favor, but how many of our employees, especially with everything that's happened this year with COVID, are not taking the insurance and, you know, doing the, you know, getting money instead? You know, it, has that changed at all? Um, hang on a second, Mike. I can tell you just in a second. I'm just, it, it may have been in the stuff that you sent, but no, it, it wasn't, but. Uh... Uh, here we go. So, um, it looks like right now, One, two, I think there's five altogether, Mike. Um, one is an EFUD employee. Um, is that any different from what we, we saw in, in like last year, non COVID year? No, I mean, we haven't, nobody signed up yet for 2021, so we won't know until this gets approved, but, but um, last year, last year there was one, two, three, four, I think five altogether, including one in EFUD. And there's okay. about 30 that are eligible. Okay, thank you. All right. I, I'm, I'm for, I think as the commissioners, I think it's, a, it's in the public sector, this is a fairly common, you know, they may get paid sometimes a little bit less than somewhere and sometimes in, in the benefits, that's where they'll, they'll be a little better. But I'm in favor. Mr. Fryer, do you have health care for your people and how many are you up or down to at this point? Uh, you have about 100 staff members and yeah, I provide health care to a certain number of them. And are you seeing the same type of increase? Um, to be honest with you, my partner deals with most of the increases and in looking at them, but I, I'm, I've definitely heard that they're going up. I'm not sure what the percentage is. We use, uh, we use MVP, I believe. And as I said in the memo, um, a number of our people have moved towards MVP. And, uh, you know, when I sent out that uh, memo to you, um, if you look on page two, the percentage um, in relation to the Blue Cross Blue Shield Platinum is going down. Now, it's still a very rich benefit, but, um, you know, we are moving that down and I'm hopeful over time you know that um, I still think it makes sense to allow people to choose which plan they uh, they take, and if some people want to take Blue Cross, um, I don't understand why they do because you know on a personal basis, based on what's offered, I have chosen to move to MVP and have had uh, fine experience with them, no issues. Um, but, but some people, you know, still like to have that Blue Cross uh, shield by, you know, um, for whatever reason. 
But when they make that choice, they're using money out of their own pocket to do that because we're, we're trying to move this more towards the MVP um, side of things. So as long as they're spending their own money, I don't see why we would care. So that's my recommendation anyway. Want a motion to hear that? Or yeah, I think it would be helpful if you just made a motion to approve the manager's recommendation for the 2021 healthcare uh, benefit. Somebody want to step up for that? I'll make a motion to approve uh, the uh, town manager's recommendation for uh, health care coverage for employees for the 2021 year. Second. second. Okay, there's Katie. Katie seconded. Any further discussion? Mark? Okay. All those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 All right, one quick question before we adjourn. Well, we have one other thing that we put on the agenda before. Okay, you I'm sorry. Yep. So um, Carla has the, uh, the request out there, but the, the Green Mountain Romer Snowmobile Club got a letter into us after the agenda went out last week. And they're looking to have permission of the select board to ride snow machines on three roads in Waterbury. Um, they are Woodard Hill, uh, Woodard Hill Extension, where we've already allowed ATVs to go, and then uh, Twin Peaks. And uh, the Twin Peaks one is basically to be able to get to the trails. They cross from Hardy Farm, cross over um, off of uh, Newland Flats and then go up to Twin Peaks to get on to some of the other trail networks. So uh, we've done this in the past. It hasn't caused us any heartburn, but they need to ask permission. So that's the request. And I think staff's recommendation is that you approve it. Okay. It does take a motion. Yep. May like to make that motion? I'll make the motion to approve the snowmobile club to include the roads as stated. Second. Any further discussion? Being none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Bill, one quick follow up. I heard that uh, maybe that snowmobile bridge going over the river is going to, is, I guess I'll use the word condemned, but maybe no longer allowed to be used. I think you're on mute still. Yeah, uh, I, I had not heard that. Uh, I really, you know, except for the, this kind of information that we get from the snowmobile club. Um, you know, I don't know a lot about their trail system. I don't. I don't have a machine myself, but um, that would be too bad if that's the case. But yeah, I'm very, it's a long way around. Yeah, that's a, that's a fairly fairly lengthy bridge, and I imagine it's a pretty good expenditure to maintain it. I guess the ice um, damaged uh, support structure on the Waterbury side, and uh, as far as I'm hearing, the state's not going to allow use of that. Wow. Moving forward. All righty, another obstacle. So my question real quick, has there been any thought about as things stand right now, how town meeting is going to be conducted? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, had a library commissioner's meeting at five o'clock before this meeting and talked this uh, about this with them a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you know, the um, whether we can meet in person for a traditional town meeting is still an open question right now. Uh, and as you know, the, the country in particular, uh, Vermont to a much lesser degree, like it's been throughout. Uh, 
starts, you know, sliding down the path towards, uh, you know, more problems, as we've been hearing about, you know, it seems a little bit, um, a little bit optimistic to think that we're going to be able to just go into the gym at the school like a normal year. Um, I took part in the VLCT annual meeting a couple of weeks ago, found fair, and you know we adopted the municipal policy, and we had that meeting uh, was a it was a virtual meeting, it was by Zoom, and uh, you know we had maybe 35 or 40 people on the Zoom call. Typically at a normal town fair, you'd have uh, 150 in the room and you know, you'd know have most of those people would be voting. And as it was, we had uh, maybe 30 people participating and it was, it was a challenge and it was not easy. Now, just for your information, the state legislature, um, I, I called Vermont League of Cities and Towns back in uh, probably June and said, you know, we better be talking to the legislature about the ability to have Australian ballot voting um, in case we can't have uh, in-person meetings. So to remind you, there's normally a two-step process to go from open town meeting like we have to uh, an Australian ballot vote on the budget. We have Australian ballot voting for officers and for bonds, but for the budget, as you know, we have um, open town meeting and uh, the motion's made, there's discussion, there can be amendments, and then we, then we vote. Um, to get to Australian ballot voting, there's a normally a two-step process where you have to have a town meeting, put it on the warning, to ask the voters if they would like to move to Australian ballot voting. And then if they say yes to that at an open town meeting, then the next town meeting, the budget is voted by Australian ballot. Um, but having that open town meeting to get to the point where you can have a ballot vote is still that problem. Uh, are you gonna be able to get people out? Is it wise to get people out into a, in, into a public space? So the legislature has passed a COVID only exception, <clears throat> which will allow the select board of any community to uh, on its own motion to simply say, we're gonna have Australian ballot voting on the budget. Now I'm not, recommending that tonight necessarily, but it is an option and uh, we're gonna have to think about it a little bit. So uh, I will check to make certain, but I'm 99% sure that passed as I just suggested it, it did. And that means if the town decides that for 2021 only, that we're gonna have Australian ballot voting, uh, we can do it. Once the COVID emergency ends, we would go back to open town meeting and would would have to go through the two-step process again. I specifically asked when we asked the legislature to allow this, not to simply allow select boards to do it on their own going forward forever. Um, and as I understand it, that's what's happened. So that's an option right now. Missed that last bit as you what? I said that's an option right now, as I understand it. We you could vote uh, to mm. to have Australian ballot voting. Um, I don't like that. Yeah. I think you all know that I much prefer open town meeting. There are definitely pros and cons. The uh, participation rate will be much higher with ballot voting, of course, but it's just an up or down, and you don't get the discussion that I think is helpful and informative, but uh, you know, there are many people who don't care about that discussion. They just want to have a chance to vote, so. Yeah, I guess my bigger concern to your point there, only allowing it to happen for one year. I mean, nobody knows how long this COVID is gonna last. And uh, 
quite honestly, I'd hate to see our open forum town meeting die because of this, you know, because of the COVID. Um, last couple of years, I've been a little bit hopeful and enthusiastic of uh, seeing a little bit more attendance. Um, I was hoping that uh, that could continue. Um, I think it's important that we all meet together and discuss these budgetary issues. Yeah, I and agree. You're right. That's where the information is gathered. I agree. But my guess is for 2021, even if we decided to have a traditional open town meeting, I my, my suspicions are that attendance will be way off. I think a lot of people are not going to be willing to come out. I would agree with that, Bill. I think you're going to see a lot of people being very hesitant. And but I'm still a little reticent about uh, having Australian ballot because one, call me a cynic, but I don't think people understand a lot of times, you know, what they're voting on. And at least a town meeting, there is some explanation of what's happening. And I think that's a really important thing for townspeople. I know some people will say the contrary because they say a few people speak for the majority. And But I will say, if you want to show up, you show up. And I think it's really, it, it engages our citizenry, you know, to learn about what's happening in town. And I think open town meeting is, is to me, is really important. Yeah, I, I agree, Mike, but I, I think, you know, we, we may have an exception in 2021 and we may have to, you know, yeah. hold our nose and do it the other way just because we don't have too much of a, of a choice. But I agree with Chris and you. I, I would not like to go that route for, for the long term, that's for sure. But can we not go to, like, some sort of a, a virtual meeting? I don't know what capacity that we have in zoom to have you know a hundred people you know on a zoom call and i know it's it, sometimes when you get bigger zoom meetings how you control a meeting gets more and more difficult so i don't know there are there are pros and cons you know yes i don't think a tr we're gonna ever we're gonna be able to have this year a very traditional town meeting just because i don't think covid is going to be cured by you know, the beginning of March. So we're either going to be a one year vote or some sort of a, you know, a hybrid or use, you know, virtual technology. And I may be leaning almost to virtual technology. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sure it's, it's probably an option. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. We're gonna have to, you know, we'll have to have somebody other than Carla or myself uh, host the meeting. You know, um, you've got to deal with the moderator. How's the moderator going to be able to interact uh, through Zoom? How are you going to recognize people who want to speak? I know just from attending that uh, VLCT meeting that it was it was not easy. It was. Um, quite cumbersome and it, it took a long time, frankly, to get through the agenda. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, so I, I'm not saying no, it, it's, it's up to the select board ultimately to decide what you're gonna wanna do, but it will be a challenge. I, I think that any way we slice it, the 2021 meeting is gonna be different and it's gonna be a bit of a challenge regardless of how we do it. You're hundred percent right. I didn't mean to complicate tonight's meeting by adding that in there, but I just thought it was uh, good that we put it in our sites because uh, it's, it's gonna be Not here before we know it. Yeah. Important discussion and it's something that's, it's gonna be here sooner than later. Yep. yep. Okay, everybody else satisfied? Yep. Uh, sounds like they are and uh, <laughs> Yeah. Again, sorry for being late on the meeting, Eric. I totally flipped my head and uh, forgot about it. So, uh, can't wait to see you on the next meeting. And uh, everybody, take care of yourselves and 
and be well till we see each other again. Hey, uh, just just out of curiosity, are you um, are you doing your normal um, November and Maine or? Right, right, right now my workload is such that uh, the first time in better than 25 years, I may have to uh, not go. And I'm beside myself because of it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, Killing myself every day trying to uh, trying to play catch up, but uh, it's just been an unbelievable. Uh, Unbelievable summer in every aspect. Uh, uh, we'll get through. We'll get through it. Okay. Well, let us know whatever your decision is ultimately. Yep. You bet. All right, Chris. Thanks. Good night. Are, are, are we meeting the first um, Monday in November? Uh, all of us except Carla. Yes. Okay. Good night. I'm busy. Yeah. I'll do yeah, I bet. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night.